Illusion is especially difficult to master because it cannot be overcome for so long as one is adhering to its ground rules. You can't be illusion by playing its game. You master it by learning the rules that it employs and then breaking them. Or better yet, refusing to play by them altogether. So one good way to begin to do this is by rejecting its premises. And one of the main premises that keeps you down under its thumb is the belief in physicality as some kind of an agency that is separate from the mind. If physics, a so-called fundamental science, is all established on a default hypothesis that just simply isn't true, then as it stands, we must disregard physics. How's that? Yes, you heard me. The rejection of physics. Some of the biggest lies we are told, lies that we believe and conform to without even so much as bothering to question them, are the claims that we are physical creatures, that reality is a physical medium, that the physical medium exists independent of the mind, and that the physical medium is located externally, separated into countless manifestations, of different physical substances, all substantially existing, unconnected to one another. I think we've come far enough along this grand narrative of existence to where we can now finally be told the truth, and wherein we can now begin to accept this truth as a new description of reality. The truth of which is that physicality is really just a denser mental state. Now when I say that reality is a mental state, I'm not referring to some kind of implication about the brain, which is the snag encountered by using the word mental. The brain is another inventory item used to draw the attention back onto the perceptibles and away from the source of attention. This misdirected attention is how we end up with the idea that an external context somehow developed wherein creatures evolved and developed brains that produced consciousness that then became self-aware of their physical existence, as opposed to a potentiality that became aware of an awareness that could imagine into existence embodied manifestations endowed with sensory organs that could perceive imaginary features of a projected world and self. Simply put, the mind imagines a brain and then attributes the brain as the identity and source of the mind. All of this may sound confusing, but it's really not all that hard to consider. As you have experiences with this type of utility every single day when you go to sleep at night and dream, the dream is a complete imaginary scenario that is taken in by an apparent point of consciousness, which is also imagined. All of which is taken at face value as a reality, wherein an independently existing persona is experiencing phenomena in some kind of independently existing medium. 
the contextual world and the independent persona, of course, are one and the same. Illusion. But this is not known to the imagined persona, because it is in delusion of the illusion. That is, it is unaware that the entire reality is a projected stream and instead is transfixed by the reflections that it is perceiving, and believes them to be existing separately from the persona it has identified as the self. But upon awakening, all of this is appreciated for what it was, and then it can be seen that the only thing that was real in any of this was the pure awareness. But, of course, the delusion continues, as what we have awoken to is the same configuration, but is even more convincing as the quality and texture of the so-called waking state has much more mass and density and is highlighted by aspects of continuity and familiarity. And this is what I'm referring to when I say that physicality is really a denser mental state. In truth, all realities consist of varying degrees of waves. Potentiality at rest is without distinction. It is like still waters, smooth and undisturbed. Now, when potentiality manifests something, that is, employs its imagination agency, this awareness acts like an impact upon the stillness, creating waves. The waves closest to the center of the impact are characterized by heavy undulations that begin to decrease in tone and volume as they expand outwards until they eventually finally dissipate completely. It's important to note that the heavy waves towards the center of the impact and the light waves that are situated furthest away from the center of the impact are identical in composition and that the only difference between them is superficial. In much the same way as H2O having different states. Water may be a solid, a liquid, or a gas. But again, the composition is the same, and the apparent difference is only superficial. The very fabric of the reality we have come to know and take for granted is no different than these examples. The vibrations near the center point are seemingly more solid, aka objects, whereas the waves that are further out are seemingly more abstract, aka concepts. Yet, there is no difference in composition. Concept and object are different states of the exact same thing. The key point to remember here is that the origin of these varying vibrations is not a physical source as we have been led to believe. Nor is the origin of the vibrations a divine source, as many of us would like to believe. The source is without distinction. Best described, it is the nothingness of potentiality essence of which is still a flawed descriptor that is attempting to characterize the ineffable. 
And of course, people don't like this because they want to personalize the impersonal. People actually prefer lies and deception to the truth because they unconsciously want to reinforce their delusion. People actually insist on embracing the false and will flee in revulsion at the slightest hint of the truth. And so people want to affix a realized possibility onto pure potentiality whether it be through science, which offers a multitude of labels pertaining to the various elements of chemistry, or to religion, which offers labels pertaining to a supernatural entity that conveniently reflects a divine version of all the attributes of man, people have a desperate need to classify that which transcends all classifications. And this is unfortunate because all of these descriptions are merely beliefs that just end up serving as restrictions. They don't actually exist, but our investment into them transforms them into self-imposed limitations. Remember, the essence of what we are is not anything manifested. Our fundamental quintessence is completely free of all commitments and positions. It is uncommitted superposition of total freedom. The second something is manifested Restriction is born. As soon as a distinction is realized, borders are established. But all of these distinctions and manifestations are composed of the same nature, illusion. And as such, the more we focus our attention on the details of the illusion, the more we will establish beliefs and value judgments which in turn give more power and life to the illusion, and hence lead to a more restrictive delusion. This is why the path to freedom is an emptying process. This is why subtraction leads to the truth. But for so long as we are addressing the nature of reality with the wrong approach, we will never even have a chance to catch a glimpse of the truth, which is, I'm quite sure, a relief to most of you. But for those who are committed to following what's true, the first step to unraveling the web of lies is found in rejecting false assumptions. The source of all things isn't anything physical. The physical is but a mere byproduct of the source. And the source isn't anything that can be arrived at by reduction, nor labeled as anything that is found in inventory.